So uh, I will start by um, uh, telling you a little bit of what we do in general in the lab, and uh, I will start explaining why I have an ice iceberg there. So we are interested in trafficking and uh, how it impacts the signaling, and the idea of the iceberg is that most of what is happening is under the surface. And I think this is very true for, for, for signaling. I mean, we are, we are uh, very, very familiar with the idea of ligands binding receptor on the surface and receptor activating transcription ultimately. But most of the action is not really happening just there when the receptor gets activated, but under the surface. And I mean, if we pick under the surface, what we see is essentially in a normal cell, uh, we can take an epithelial cell, but not necessarily so, uh, a structure like that, so our infrastructure that, uh, that uh, essentially modulates uh, the uh, presence of receptor for signaling and their amount using a very complex uh, system of uh, vesicular organelles that you, can see, that you can see here. This is really akin to the, an infrastructure for moving things. And uh, like in a, in a highway system, this is important for, for things that need to go from A to B, but as they go from A to B, they also perform some action. So, you know, as that often happens in the highway, there are also, uh, there are also not only things that are moving from A to B, but also, you know, workers that are building something, so functions that are performed there. And so nowadays we consider the endocytic uh, system as a sort of a matrix that is very, very integrated with, with the signaling that is occurring in the cell. And, uh, perhaps this is the general message that uh, will come through my presentation. Okay, so in general, why are we interested in understanding trafficking in the context of signaling? Well, because there are several examples of alteration of trafficking that, uh, have, uh, uh, that are described in tumors. So here you don't really have to read the table, but it's just to give you a sense of a list of uh, proteins that are very well known to be mutated and, and altered in tumors that have to do with, with trafficking in the cell. So essentially, just to keep on with the metaphor, you, you have a lot of examples where your infrastructure is severely altered and that contributes to the tumor phenotype. So what, uh, you know, this, the knowledge of what is going on here could, uh, could yield is a normalization of what is going on. So, so you can go back to that uh, to that uh, normal function in infrastructure and therefore correct the tumor defects. But the other thing that you can do for tumors that have alteration in signaling but not necessarily have alteration of trafficking, you can also uh, use this infrastructure, and I will show example of this in what we do, use the infrastructure to counteract excessive signaling. So in, again, in keeping on with the metaphor, what you could do is blocking excessive signaling by, by blocking uh, the infrastructure or altering infrastructure at, at a certain step. Okay, so uh, I mostly work uh, with the Drosophila system, and in the Drosophila system is very useful, we know, because it allows to do genetics uh, uh, very easily, and back when I was a postdoc, we actually modeled uh, tumors that have problems of endocytosis in Drosophila. And uh, here is an example of that. So what you're looking at here is a normal larva. And in the, in the larva of Drosophila, there is an epithelial organ, which is the eye antenna imaginal disc, which you see here, which is essentially a, an organ formed by a, an epithelial monolayer here. So, so when you look into mutants of endocytic genes, that control trafficking here. Uh, in several of those, you see that in fact, uh, if you make just the organ mutant, you get uh, a tumor. So you get a three-dimensional uh, mass of cells that are no more epithelially polarized. And this is, in this specific example, is by mutating a gene that control the sorting of the receptors or sorting of cargos in general, from the early endosome where they have been internalized to the degradative pathway. And in fact, we, and in fact, we, we found that by expanding this uh, model and testing several endocytic mutants, 
mutants in endocytic genes that were already known to control endocytosis. And we found that in all the cases in which we were blocking internalization, so blocking the entry of receptors from the membrane in the endocytic system, we would have certain amount, a certain kind of, grazie. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So by blocking the internalization step, so the entry of the receptors in the, in the pathway, we would have multiple alteration in metagenic signaling okay, by, through these pathways, and also alteration in other features of a polarized cells like, uh, like polarity. And, and also we would affect uh, uh, indirect effects like, like apoptosis by blocking at a different step, which is the step of, of in fact, sorting towards degradation, we would have another set of phenotypes. So of course, this only says that the, the endocytic structure of the cells is very, is very much controlling multiple, at multiple step signaling and, and, and polarity. Okay, we became focused on a particular signaling pathway and for the rest of the talk, I will focus on this, which is NOTCH. And I'm gonna give you a, a brief introduction of how NOTCH works. So this is the NOTCH receptor, which is the main uh, transducer of, of this signaling pathway. And this is made by essentially an extracellular portion which binds ligands, which normally are ligands exposed by nearby cells. So it's a paraffin signaling, cells need to touch to signal. And upon ligand binding, a number of proteolytic events lead ultimately to the cleavage of the cytoplasmic uh, intracellular part of the receptor, which essentially contains a, a, a transcription factor. So you can see this as a sort of a membrane tether transcription factor, a transcription factor that is essentially sitting on the membrane and is influenced by this pathway and is released from the membrane and can behave as a transcription factor in a very regulated way. Okay, so we specifically, what we could do with this uh, system and this model in Drosophila back then was essentially to test what would happen to notch signaling activation when endocytosis was altered. And I'm gonna, since this is already all published, I'm gonna basically skip on a lot of data and I will give you just one experiment to show you this. Okay, so we can follow activation of notch in multiple contexts in Drosophila during development because this is used over and over for self-state, self-fate determination. And in one particularly useful context, we can look in ovaries of the adult female and here what you see is essentially different stages of development of the egg chambers, which are the units of which the ovaries are composed. So here you have in this posterior side a developing oocyte, and the germline, which you see here, is covered by a follicular epithelium, which is trophic. And we know from previous work that there is a specific activation event for notch at a transition between the stage five of development, which is this one, and stage six. And this signaling event depends on the uh, sudden expression of a ligand in the germline cells, which touches the receptor that is exposed on the follicle cells. And so you can easily monitor activation of signaling by looking at the expression of target gene around the stage, which is not present around here, okay? So here is what happens if you look at uh, a section, a confocal section through these stages of the egg chamber, and these, these uh, have been stained with an antibody against a target of notch called hindsight. So around stage five, you have no notch signaling activation in the follicle cells, and so there's no expression of the target, and here you get expression of the target. So here the idea is very simple to test how notch signaling is influenced by endocytosis, specifically in these receiving cells where the receptor has to be activated, you can make these cells mutant for, 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 for one of these endocytic genes and ask whether the signaling is activated or not. And in fact, if you make patches of mutant cells, which are here highlighted by, by the pink line, for dynamine, which is essentially in the enzyme that controls the pinching off of, of, of coated pits uh, that leads to the formation of vesicles that can go into the endosome, you can see 
that, uh, that uh, activation of signaling is uh, severely blocked. So that internalization is required to some extent to activate the signaling. That back at the time was kind of surprising considering that, that most of the field thought that the signaling would occur directly from, from the plasma membrane. Okay, so this is another example in which we blocked the entry into the early endosome by essentially making the cells mutant for RAB5, a GTPase, which is very important for fusing vesicles into the early endosome. And again, you would see uh, loss of activation of notch. Okay, in this case, we are blocking HRS, which is important for sorting of cargos uh, to be included in the internal luminal side of the endosome and route to degradation. And in this case, as you can see, there was no effect on activation of signaling. So this suggests that once the receptor gets to the early endosome, it can be activated in this particular cell type. And then what uh, happens later on is not really important, except for one set of mutants, which we ended up characterizing more, which block essentially the inward budding of the receptors here. And this is the case of TSG101 and all the, the set of genes that are called escorts that essentially code for the machinery that does this inward budding. In this case, we got another phenotype, quite surprising, surprising phenotype in which there was much more signaling, okay? And also you would start to see signaling at the stage where there is no ligand around, so precocious signaling. So that suggests that in these mutants, when you essentially notch can reach here and then get stuck midway through being internalized internally, something would happen to the molecule that even in absence of ligand would lead to ectopic activation. And this, of course, was uh, potentially very interesting because ectopic activation, as I will show later, is one feature of oncogenic notch signaling that is observed in a number of tumors. Okay? All right, so in general, what I've shown you in this introduction is that we took a rather linear pathway, the way it was understood, in which you have ligand binding and then release of the, the internal part of the receptor by cleavage uh, into the nucleus for signaling, and we understood how complex it could be when you started playing with trafficking. So essentially, we we got, we got these. So this, of course, is not something that we only have done back then, but uh, it was in the context of a field that, that showed uh, a big importance of, of trafficking in general for activation of this particular signaling pathway. For instance, a lot uh, uh, is known on the role of internalization, and here I am listing the processes and some genes that have been associated at the level of the ligand. So the ligand, which I told you is expressed by the nearby cells, also need internalization to be able to, to activate the receptor. And in fact, here people have been recently found that you actually need the, the pooling force of internalization in order to change the conformation of the receptor and, and essentially peel off the extracellular part of the receptor which is a prerequisite for the cleavage. Another, another aspect that is very important is the secretion. And in, during secretion, a number of things happen that are necessary for activation of the signaling. Uh, for instance, the receptor needs to be furing cleaved to be presented as an heterodimer. So if you don't do that, you're not, you cannot peel off the extracellular side. Uh, and then you have to modify in various ways the, the receptor to make it with, with sugar on, 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 on the extracellular side to make it competent for binding the ligands. And, and some sugar modifiers like fringe are very important because they bias the ability of the receptor to bind the different ligands. And this has been shown to be very important in certain signaling contexts. What we have found and we have contributed to find on the endocytic part of, of the world fits in the, in the increasing role of, of, of internalization that, that people have also characterized at the level of uh, ubiquitination events that are necessary at the plasma membrane to support this internalization. And, and a bunch of E3 ligases have been shown to be important there. And, uh, and uh, uh, there are other activities like the endocytic adapter NAMB, which 
are very important to essentially regulate how much notch gets into the cell and how much notch can traffic and be degraded. And uh, what we have shown uh, at the level of, uh, of late endocytosis is also supported by evidence in the literature for other ubiquity modifiers that seems to be acting around here to decide how much of notch here needs to be incorporated for degradation and how much of notch needs to stay on the limiting membrane, okay? And this is, there is a bunch of papers from a number of groups that have been pulled out other, other components like ops proteins and beta restins that act down here. But essentially, you know, this part of the work illuminated another aspect, which is the receptor can be activated certainly from the plasma membrane, but in certain contexts can be also activated in both a ligand dependent and ligand independent way from endosomes. So this pointed to the endosomes an internal compartment, which is very known to sort of dispatch uh, receptors around and control signaling that way uh, as, as an important station for, for activation. And so when I started my lab, we started uh, looking a lot into the role of endosome in activation of notch signaling. Okay, so, so the question became, how is activation regulated in endosomes? Okay, so in order to do that, we took again a genetic approach and we asked the question, or at least we, we, we sort of formulated the hypothesis that if trafficking of the receptor is important to sig for signaling, to find new components that might illuminate a mechanism uh, of activation in endosome, we could look in mutants in Drosophila in which the trafficking of the receptor was altered. Okay, so we screen for those. So how do you screen for that? So we looked into, for instance, an organ that is uh, called imaginal disc. This is the same thing that I showed you before in the cross section in, in the larvae. So this is a, 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 a cross section, a perpendicular cross section to the one before. And so you see the, the part that will form the adult eye here. And in this part, the photoreceptors are forming at this particular stage of development. And this is the part that will form the antenna of the fly. So you have to imagine this part popping out at you like a radio antenna, and that will be the antenna. So here we have stain for notch, and as you can see, notch is in this organ, is localized mostly in these folds, and these folds are the apical, where you cap the apical surface of, of the epithelium. And then there is a lot of localization here because it notch has a role in the former forming photoreceptor, which are a very complex, uh, multicellular organization. And so we, we essentially made uh, mutants uh, by, by, by chemical mutagenesis, and then we made the organs mutant, so we allowed the development of the larva by just uh, looking only at the mutations that affect the eye antennal disc. And we found things like that. So this is an example in which you see that in gra uh, the biggest in a big portion of, of the epithelium, there is much more notch, and notch seems to be not present mostly in the folds, but in, inside the cells, it's clumped inside the cells, okay? So I'm, I, you know, this is all published, so I'm not gonna show you every single experiment, but it turns out that these clumps of notch are actually inside the cells, and it's mostly notch that's accumulated in late endosome and lysosome, so notch that cannot be degraded. And when we mapped the gene, we found that, uh, that the, the, the mutation was mapping, in fact, to VHA68, which is a gene that encodes for a subunit of a very important uh, machine, which is called vacuolar ATPase. So the vacuolar ATPases are essentially uh, proton pumps, and I will, as I will describe in a minute, that are sitting uh, on membranes, okay, on the plasma membrane and on membranes of, of organelles throughout the cells. Okay, so, so, so when we saw this phenotype, the first thing that we said, we said, okay, let's look in other mutants uh, and see whether we see the same and whether we find other mutants that in, fa in fact map to the, to the same gene. And we in fact found another mutant in our screen that had a very similar phenotype. And when we mapped it, it turned out to be encoding for the B subunit. And then we found another one that turned out to encode for the H subunit. So three parts of the same gene were essentially giving the, the same phenotype. And so the, 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 the prediction was that, in fact, 
this was really dependent, this, this mislocalization on notch, dependent on, 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 on uh, blocking the function of the vacuole RTPase. So as I said, the vacuole RTPase is essentially a proton pump. So what it does is that it has a, a, an RTPase domain here, which is pretty typical, which uses RTP energy to essentially pump uh, protons across uh, a pore, which is transmembrane, and, and, and is identified as this V0 sector. The pump normally is uh, present, uh, 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 as I said, in endomembranes and on the plasma membrane, and it's not always assembled like that. It can be separated in the sector in the cytoplasm and this sector, of course, sitting in membranes, and when it's needed or where it is needed, it can be assembled together. So the first question that we asked back then was, okay, are we looking at mutants that have a problem in acidification? So one way you can do that in Drosophila is that instead of making an organ that is completely mutant, you make an organ that has patches of cells that are mutant, pretty much like I showed you before with this follicular epithelium. So here you are looking at a cross-section of this imaginal disc that you have seen before, where the green cells are wild type and the black patches of cells are mutant. And so what we have done here is we have taken such, such a mosaic tissue and we culture that in presence of lysotracker, which is incorporated in acidic compartments. And as you can see here, in the, mute, in the wild type cells, you can light up a number of acidic compartments, which essentially are late endosome and, and lysosome, whereas the mutant cells were completely black. So in these cells, acidification is completely lost. And this is consistent with the fact that all the mutations that I showed you are essentially loss of function, non mutation. So they block, they truncate uh, the gene very, very early. The second thing that we did was to look into, uh, into the structure of the mutant cells by EM and compare it to wild type. And so here is a cross section of uh, through the apical surface of the epithelium. And I hope you can see there is essentially one, two, three cells that are basically arrayed. In, a, in an epithelium, and what we were particularly interested in was uh, late endosome and lysosome at this point. You can see the late endosomes very well here because they are organelles that contain other vesicles. As I showed you before in the cartoon, at a certain stage of maturation, you have the formation of internal vesicles in which the receptor to be degraded and the cargo to be degraded are accumulated, and so you can see them very well by morphology. And so when you look at the mutant cells, what we saw typically was that the cells were filled up with huge late endosomes that were containing a lot of vesicles. And so this suggested that when the, 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 uh, the cells are, are, have no VATPase activity and so acidification doesn't occur, uh, you, you fail to degrade all these vesicles that you form, in, form in, the, in the late endosome. This is sort of the expected phenotype because one thing that acidification is very required for in the late endosome is to allow the formation of a luminal environment that is very acid in which the lipases, the acid lipases and the li acid proteases are working to degrade all the carbons, okay? So this was, a, let's say, a somewhat general phenotype that we would expect. But the question was, what would happen to notch signaling? And um, uh, essentially, the, the short answer, and I'm going to show you one example of one experiment, is that notch signaling would not get activated in these mutant cells. Okay? This was somewhat surprising, because if you think of it, what I told you before is notch in this particular context requires internalization and entry into the early endosome to be activated. But once it's there, then activation is normal. Okay, and then you know if you don't degrade it properly, then you can get uh, this ectopic activation. But uh, if you are only blocking things very, very late in the lysosome when notch is already into these vesicles, that's that's not a notch that can signal, and you should not get any any notch phenotype. In fact, when we compared what we were, what was happening here with notch with lysosomal mutants or mutants that would block events in the lysosome, signaling was simply not affected. Whereas in this case, there was a complete loss of signaling, and I'm going to show you an experiment to demonstrate that. OK, so bear with me. All right, so in this experiment, what we did is that we took, actually, 
uh, an activated form of notch, which is called notch delta E, and is essentially a notch that lacks the extracellular domain, but is still attached to the membrane. So this is a constitutively active, because it doesn't need the, the ligand, and it can be cleaved off by the enzyme that cleaves notch, which is called gamma secretase, epily. So when you express it in patches of cells, and here are the cells that are expressing these are the green ones, these patches of cells grow very well, because what notch does in the context of development here, one of the things that it does is uh, supporting proliferation. So the cells divide very well, and you, and you get very big clones of cells that overexpress notch. Okay, so we did the same experiment, but now we express these in the green cells, but we also make the green cells mutant for one of these VITPase components that I showed you before. So when you do these, you, as you can appreciate, you get very, very tiny clones. So the, the constitutively active uh, uh, notch that you can detect by, by, by staining is still there, but is unable to support proliferation. Now, the, that suggested that, well, first of all, together with other data that I'm not showing you today, that notch would not be activated in these cells. And secondly, that, uh, that uh, there was an inability to activate notch from, from at the step of release from the plasma membrane. Because here, we are not affecting the ligand. We are only, uh, the only thing that has to happen for this construct to be activated is to be constitutively cleaved by gamma secretase. Okay? So there was something that was blocked there. So in order to, to confirm that, what we did is we, we took the mutant cells, and now instead of expressing these, we express a cytoplasmic form of notch, which is equally constitutively active. If you put it in normal cells, which I'm not going to show, if you put it in normal cells, it will make huge clones as much as those. And, and now the question was, what would it be, in, uh, be doing in, in VATPase mutant cells? And what it does is exactly indistinguishable from what I've said. So if you take the cells and then you express in uh, the, the, the pre-cleave notch, that can be... Uh, uh, can do exactly what notch does, which namely is going into the nucleus, sitting on, on, on the promoters, and activating transcription. Okay? So this suggested that whatever the, the vacuum TPAs would do, uh, on top of controlling the, the degradation of notch, to activation of notch signaling had to happen around release of notch from a membrane. Okay. So, as I said, we, we recently published this initial characterization, and it was nice to see that pretty much around the same time, another lab independently uh, reported the same finding using, well, they picked up uh, different uh, genes that are still components of the VTPAs having essentially the same phenotypes, and this was followed up by other two papers later on that showed the same things in, 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 in essentially mouse. And so this led to this idea that there was something in, the, in, in, in allowing the formation of a, a acidification gradient or, or directly at the level of, of, of the pump uh, that would be required for productive notch signaling, potentially at the level of releasing notch from the plasma membrane. And, and we didn't know pretty much where, whether at the plasma membrane or in the endosome, but we had some data in the paper, and you can go and look at them, suggesting that at least upon a, a, a topic activation of notch, this could happen from endosomes. Okay, so this is just a, a brief summary of what I told you so far. Okay, so now the, this, this, this is good and, and well. I mean, it's, it's great to, to, to try to understand what happens to notch physiologically, but we were also interested because, as I told you, there are several contexts in which notch activation is ectopic, and, and essentially notch is behaving as an oncogene there. So there is too much signaling. And what you want to do is to block it. So we wanted to see whether something that we have learned here with Rosophila could apply, in fact, to, uh, to uh, human cells and in, in two more contexts. Okay. So, so the good thing here is that the VITPases are, have been studied for, for, for long, and so there were inhibitors that one could use that are very specific to block activity of these pumps. Okay. So the question is, can we block now notch signaling by inhibiting the VTPAs in, 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 in a relevant context? Okay. So this is essentially what I told you before, that notch is fre frequently an oncogene. This is the case specifically for it's essentially 60-70% of, of T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemias. 
in this schematic you have essentially mutations that have been found in, in patients and how they are able to essentially transduce signaling and this is the, the, the basal level and you can see that, that most of these mutations give ectopic signaling and this is in absence of any ligands. It's just that the receptor has mutation uh, that let's say make it prone to lose the extracellular side and make the, 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 the transcription factor more stable. Okay? So that's, that's what happens. The other aspect in which Notch has been quite well studied, the other example that I give here is actually from our institute where, where the, the, the overactivation of Notch has been found in the context of a number of breast cancers and see essentially here you see uh, the activated form of Notch in, a, in an high grade tumor versus a, a low grade breast tumor and here is the target gene of Notch and you see high expression versus very low expression, okay? So, so why would one bother to just uh, go all the way to look into the VATPases? Well, essentially because uh, there has been a, a, a number of ways to block signaling that has been developed, uh, which are listed here. So at the level of the ligand, uh, people have developed, developed decoy ligands that, that can, can prevent the activation or, or, or inhibitors antibody that can bind and stabilize the receptor and prevent the activation. Other ways that have been explored are essentially inhibitors of the enzyme that, that makes the last cut that are called gamma secretase inhibitors, GSIs, inhibitors of other enzymes that, that make the previous cut, and other things in the nucleus. But, but basically the, 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 the common feature of all of these is that zero known are in the clinics. So you have basically 70% of of uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemias and various cancer for which you don't have a specific drug that you can give to a patient. I mean, some of these will come, but for now, there's nothing, okay. So, so okay, so can we use inhibitors for the vascular TPAs to actually block signaling? And so, first of all, what we wanted to see is whether what we have seen in Drosophila would hold true in human cells. What I showed you is essentially that the VATPAs inhibitors are behaving like, like the null situations and they impair the degradation of notch in, in breast cells, they reduce physiologic activation of notch on the co-culturing assay, and they reduce also the, the, the spontaneous activation that is ligand independent. And so, so we are following up on this, this is still unpublished and, and what we are trying to do now is bring this in more <coughs> uh, in vivo to more models with Xenograph and, and other stuff that we have done with zebrafish that I'm not, I don't have time to uh, to show today. But the, the, other, the other interesting bits is that while we were doing this work, the VITPAs became sort of very hot in the sense that uh, a year after we published the paper in Drosophila, a bunch of group reported that, uh, that essentially mutants in VITPAs are important also for wingless signaling. And in fact, they found that there is a very specific interaction between one component of, of the pump and, and some wind core receptors and according to their data in, in model system and in human cells, you have a strong reduction of canonical and uncanonical wind signaling activation when the pump is not properly made. Uh, and, and, and more recently, just you know, last year, another flurry of paper came out in which they found that essentially the VATPAs is very important through an interaction uh, with a complex called regulator, which essentially regulates activation of TOR signaling from the late endosome, okay? So essentially, this thing, which is the most, one of the most of skipping protein complexes that you can think of, seems to be quite a nexus for regulation of a number of signaling pathways, and an axiom that, that, again, is very connected to the trafficking inf infrastructure or the endocytic infrastructure of the cell, okay? So in a sense, it will bring, you know, what, what, what is coming out is that it's, 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 these, these data are bringing the site of the action from the plasma membrane to the late endosome and the lysosome, which, you know, it makes perfect sense and is sort of expected for TOR signaling because one of the things that TOR signaling does on top of, you know, sensing the insulin uh, uh, pathway at the plasma membrane is also sensing the amino acids that are produced in a cell oftentimes from degradation of proteins in the late endosome and in the lysosome. 
But essentially, this suggested to us that in fact this thing could be a non-skipping uh, uh, complex, but essentially it could be sort of used by, by signaling in, in multiple ways. And so you can think of two things. So one thing is that it's, it's only part of the engine, so you take it out and you have all sorts of problems in signaling. The other thing is that, yes, it's part of the engine, but it might be also regulated, in fact, to support signaling in different ways. So we went back to Drosophila, and in the last part of the talk, I'm going to concentrate on unpublished data regarding these, and we ask whether the activity or expression of, of, of this uh, these complex is essentially dependent on, on is regulated during, during, during development, a time in which cell fate and signaling decisions are, are happening. And so we were particularly interested in understanding whether, in fact, the, the activity of the pump or the expression of the pump might be regulated to support notch signaling event, wind signaling event. Okay. All right, so, so in order to do that, we started looking in knock-in of genes that are encoding parts of the pump. So in this particular example, we have a, a transgenic fly that has a GFP inserted in, in, in the coding of VHA16. VHA16 is essentially making part of the pore here uh, in, in the pump. And uh, the first thing that, that we wanted, so this was already be available, is part of one of these projects where, where people make a lot of transgenics by inserting GFP in a number of genes, and then this can be useful to look at, uh, to do de developmental studies and all sorts of studies and look where, where proteins are expressed. And so the first thing that we did is, uh, is actually validating that uh, this tool was good for reading out the uh, expression of this thing. And so the way we did is we looked in a place where the, the VITPase is highly expressed and asked whether we could see signal. So one place in Drosophila where you need a lot of VITPase, this time at the plasma membrane to acidify the extracellular compartment is actually in the stomach of the fly. So we looked in the gut, which you can see here. So this is where the mouth would be. And, uh, and we know that the stomach is around here. And as you can appreciate, the stomach, which is highly acidic, like any good stomach, and express a lot of this, is light up with, with this. So this suggests that, in fact, our, our, our tool is good to look, at, look uh, at the expression of a component of the pump. But of course, as I said, uh, we were interested in developmental context in which we can monitor notch signaling activation and see whether there is variation of expression of, of components of the pump. And so we went to imaginal discs again, which are these organs that will give adult organs. And for instance, we look in imaginal discs, as you will see, that are precursor of the wing, and they are called wing discs. So this is an adult wing. And an adult wing is patterned during the larva in, 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 in the imaginal disc. And in fact, you can and a cartoon of the imaginal disc is here. And in fact, you can already define in the wing imaginal disc of the larva the regions that, for instance, will give rise to the veins of the wing, which are here in blue. So these are called provein regions. And for instance, other features other feature of the wing, like the, the, the bristles here that are important for sensing the air and, and the environment, which are made by a number of so-called pluneural clusters that are here highlighted in, in red. So this is the area that will make the wing blade that you see here. So imagine that this expands and comes into you. This is the dorsal part, which is the face that you see, the ventral part, the faces that below, and this is the margin, which makes this. Uh, and these are the areas that will develop the hinge and the thorax so to which the wing is attached. Okay, so the, what I'm telling, why I'm telling you all this is that Notch is heavily involved in setting up these areas. So in fact, okay, in fact, in both the proneural cluster and in the formation of the provein, you need the, the so-called lateral inhibition that goes through activation of Notch in doublets of cells. So you have one cell that is called signal sending cells, which will express the ligand, in this case, delta, and one cell that is the signal receiving cell that will activate notch signaling. And for instance, in the, in the provein region, 
the provein which will give rise to the vein is the delta rho cell and, and the intervein tissue is essentially the, the tissue in which notch is, is activated. So you need that sharp boundary from, from the sending cells to the receiving cells to make a vein. Uh, also here, as the, this cluster differentiate, a single cell inside, as we will see, will become the sending cells and the surrounding cells will be receiving cells. So this has been very well characterized. And the question here is, would we see in these areas differences of expression for components of the buckler or TPAs? Okay. So here is, for instance, a staining. I don't know if you can really see it for, for delta, which is highlighting the signal sending cells. And as you can see here are two of the stripes of the provein regions. And here are two of the stripes of where the pluneural clusters are, are developing. So we simply looked in imaginal disk for, for these transgenic flies uh, where the G, GFP expression reports expression of this gene. And as you can see, the level of expression is non uh, uniform across the tissue, but you can identify, in fact, several areas arranged in stripes that essentially are corresponding to the delta positive provein regions and to the proneural clusters. Okay? And also in other SOPs, as you can see, for instance, there is one here in which the SOP cells that is delta positive is, is highlighted and, and the surrounding tissue is expressing less. Right, so another thing that we did, we, we did an experiment in which we increase activity of the pump. So now instead of reducing the expression and hopefully reducing the activity of the pump, what we are doing is trying to increase ectopical expression of the pump. And you can do that by uh, overexpressing the a subunit of the, of, of the pump, which in yeast controls the coupling of this sector on the pump so if you, again, we do this in a stripe across the disc. And as you can see here, the resulting uh, uh, tissue is quite messy because overexpression is pretty bad for these cells. But nevertheless, if we look in, in, in the, the, the flies that carry the sensor for expression of the subunit, when we push and force assembly of the pump, we also get much more expression of this gene. This suggests that there is a positive feedback loop if you make more assembled pump, you get more expression of the subunit here. And we know that the pump is assembled and, and functioning because now if we take the disc and we do a lysotracker assay to mark the acidified compartment, this stripe lights up. So you have much more acidified uh, compartment in these cells. So, so you get a huge increase in, 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 in acidification in endosomes. So now the question is, OK, if I do this manipulation, what happens to signaling? So this is a very, very, let's say, artificial situation. But still, you can do this. And then you take the disk, you extract RNA, and you do qPCR for target genes of various signaling pathways. So we have done this on a pattern of signaling pathway to get a sense of what increased pump activity would mean to signaling. And here I'm going to just show you two examples. So one is a target of notch. And here in the overexpression is in green. This is the wild type control. And this is overexpression of an activated notch as a positive control. So if you express activated notch to in, this, in this stripe, you get an increase. You pick up an increase in signaling, whereas when you do uh, the, the overexpression of the uh, of the subunit of the pump and you increase pump activity, you pick up, uh, let's say, some to some extent, a decrease. So now the the other interesting bit is about wind signaling. I told you that that the pump seems to be also important for wind signaling. And what you get in, in the case of wind target is the opposite. So here is the overexpression, and here is the control. You get. Uh, uh, a quite a sharp increase in activation of target genes. And here, uh, the, in this control, we get also an increase because in this imaginal disk, notch activation is upstream of wind activation. So if you uh, boost activity of notch, you also get an increase of, of wind signaling. OK, so this suggests somewhat that, OK, if you reduce uh, uh, the expression of one component of the pump, 
you increase notch signaling in the sending cells. Here we cannot really control where we are in the signal cells, in the sending cells or in the receiving cells because we are expressing in the whole stripe. But essentially you get an increase in wind signaling. So normally, uh, normal levels of the pump uh, will keep it to a certain level. Here you may make more pump, more wind signaling. And you're not affecting much or if anything, you are reducing a bit uh, notch signaling. So, so, but again, this suggested that somehow the, the amount of the pump can, can move signaling around. And so we, we wanted to also do the opposite experiment. And in fact, what we did is we activated now, uh, we activated now wingless signaling in the disk and we asked whether that does something to expression of the pump. So we took our sensor and we look in disk that have a, a, a stably active form of beta catenin, which is the transducer for for wingless signaling. So to conclude this third part uh, uh, in which we look at development, what we think is happening is that through development in situation in which you need to uh, act on sulfate by switching on notch signaling, so you have two cells that, that have an equal level of notch signaling to start with and they have an equal level of VATPase expression. And we think in these, in these set of cells, uh, essentially the VATPAs might help promoting activation of, of, of notch as we see in receiving cells in other contexts. And, and, and as, okay, as delta notch differentiation occurs, this essentially shapes the, the, the cluster of cells so that the more VATPAs expression is actually here than here, okay? And what we can deduce from our manipulation of, of signaling, this is reinforced by the fact that as the cell essentially stops notch signaling here and, and express more delta to, to direct activation of signaling down here, the expression, the expression it goes up. And here in the cells that activate notch signaling, as we have seen, when we topically activate notch, expression goes down. And what we think is happening, so all in these situations, which of course in, in many, many instances, uh, uh, oftentimes these, these, these differentiation are also needing uh, to, to control wind signaling. So what we think is that uh, in, in these, in these uh, set of cells that now have more VATPs activity, you, what you could do, you could support and, and expand uh, and, and extend activation of wind signaling, okay. So how this molecular could work, we still don't have an idea, but it's interesting to find that if we look at the structure of the promoter of this gene, we find a very, very conserved E box that is conserved across the standard set of 12 drosophila genomes that people <coughs> use to actually look at, at, at conservations in, 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 in drosophila. And, and so these E-box are very important because they are the binding site for a class of transcription factors that are called helix loop helix. And these transcription factors are downstream of, of notch and have been shown oftentimes to, uh, to essentially transduce the fate that, that the notch delta de doublet uh, impose on cells. For instance, uh, uh, this is uh, a site that could be bound by, by sequence by the acute scoot complex which essentially is, is, um, is activated in, is an activatory complex that, that can be activated in delta cells and the enhancer split that in notch cells uh, represses transcription. Okay, so what we think is happening is that part of the regulation that we see, and we are gonna test that with, with, with mutants now, could go through uh, expression of this. The other thing, to, through, through the E-box, the other thing that we are doing now is that we are expanding with, by looking at other knock-ins lines that are available for other components of the VATPAs to see whether there is a common regulation across, across the subunits. All right, so I, I'm basically at the end. So what I show you today is that notch requires VATPAs activity in receiving cells, that the VATPAs and notch acts on notch mostly at the membrane and, and it's important for release. This was again in the receiving cells. Uh, that VATPase inhibition in this context reduce notch signaling and this attains to physiologic activation of signaling and, and ectopic activation. 
the, I showed you in the in the in the, the last part of the talk that that in the sending cells the story is quite different, and that there are a number of loops that exist that control potential expression of the ATPase components. And this again is is uh, the bottom line I would say. Uh, that, that again shows once more that trafficking and signaling are very interconnected. So what we think is happening here is that, uh, and so what's our hypothesis for the future is that the trafficking of NOSH might be regulated so that you are essentially through the, also the activity of the ATPase, you're sending more NOSH to degradation as opposed to sending it less and keeping it on the limiting membrane of these organelles to be activated and that's why in cells that might have more ATPase activity, you might depress notch signaling because you're sending more to degradation, whereas in the cells that have a little less, you might keep a little bit more to be activated in endosomes. So I'm realizing that I'm going quite over time, but I just want to thank people in the lab. So the, the, the work here the, on the last part has been done by two, two students in the lab, Emiliana and Arianna, the work on cells, and the, the work initially on Drosophila was done by a postdoc, Serena Duki, and is now done by a student, Francis Copia. I didn't have time to tell you about uh, what, what the other people in, in the lab have done, and I have to acknowledge my former boss and uh, collaborators that we have on the VATPAs now in, in Freiburg and internal collaborators in the, in the Di Fiore group. And that's our founding, and I'm done, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>